Hi right, guys, welcome to this video on the nervous control of muscle contraction. We're just going to think for a brief while about how the nervous system controls the way that our muscles contract and produce force. So, what you can see on screen here is an example of a neuron. And muscle fibres contract when an electrical impulse arrives via a neuron at the end plate, sometimes called the axon terminal. So this simply means it's this, this funny looking thing that's on the screen here. Um, basically, an electrical impulse arrives from the brain or the central nervous system. It's passed along neuron to neuron to neuron until it reaches a muscle fibre or a group in this case, a group of muscle fibres. Um, and that electrical impulse passes from the end plate and jumps across. Um, and the technical details are not necessary for us to know uh, at this, this level. Um, but essentially that electrical impulse uh, causes the contraction of the muscle fibres that it's attached to, that it's touching. Uh, and each neuron is touching not all the fibres, but a group of fibres. And it's that group of fibres that will contract, not the whole muscle, but that group of fibres that will contract when the neuron passes the electrical impulse into those fibres. And we call that innovation or recruitment. So each neuron will innovate or recruit a group of fibres, similar to ones that you can see on the screen now. And this group of fibres, together with the neuron, is called a motor unit. A motor unit. That's a really important key term to understand. A motor unit is a, is a neuron and all the muscle fibres, a group of muscle fibres, that that neuron innovates. What's really important to know about these motor units is that all the fibres in a motor unit are of the same type. That means when the neuron meets the fibres, we're either talking about a group of fibres that are type 1 fibres, type 2A fibres or type 2X fibres. They're always a group of the same type of fibre innovated by that one neuron. And there may be more or there may be fewer fibres, but all the fibres are of the same type. A muscle, for example, the biceps, is made up of several motor units, several motor units. And it may be more or less, again, depending on the muscle, depending on the role of the muscle. Um, but every muscle is made up of several motor units, which means, therefore, for each muscle, there are a whole group, a whole bunch of neurons that are needed to innovate each muscle. Importantly, we have something called the all or none law, which helps us explain how it is that motor units are recruited in order to make muscles contract. So we've said already that a muscle is made up of a group of motor units. So each muscle may have more or less, but each muscle will have several motor units in being innovated by their own neurons. How does this happen? Well, the first thing to note is that an electrical impulse is sent along the neuron, reaches the axon terminal, and then either innovates the fibres or doesn't. But importantly, only if the impulse is sufficient, that electrical impulse that's moving along the neuron, if there's sufficient impulse, if sufficient electrical impulse passing along, then all of the fibres in that motor unit, that's all the fibres that that neuron attaches to, all of them will contract. Not some of them, not one or two, but however many there are attached to that neuron, if the electrical impulse is significant enough, if it's great enough, then all of those fibres will contract. And if the electrical signal is not sufficient, even if it's there, but very faint, if that signal is not sufficient to meet a certain threshold, then none of those fibres will contract. So if the impulse is sufficient, all the fibres in the motor unit contract, otherwise none of them contract. And this is what we know as the all or none law. So every motor unit has a certain threshold. And if the electrical impulse that's sent from the central nervous system doesn't reach that threshold, then none of those fibres will contract in that whole motor unit. So therefore, in a muscle, at the muscle scale, at the level of muscle, where there's several motor units, if we want to create more force in a muscle, what we need to do is we need to innovate more motor units. So let's say there's 20 motor units in a muscle. Each of those can only be turned on or off. They're either contracting fully or not contracting at all. That's the all or none law. 
However, in the muscle as a whole, if there's 20 of them, we could perhaps turn four of them on. We could have four of them contracting fully and the other 16 not contracting at all. And that would produce from the muscle overall a relatively low amount of force. Or we could turn them all on. We would have all 20 motor units in that muscle contracting and that would therefore produce the maximum force that that muscle was capable of. So the overall force of a muscle is dependent on the number of motor units within that muscle contracting or not contracting. But the motor units themselves, these kind of subunits, each one attached to a neuron, is either on or off. It's all or none. If the impulse is sufficient, they're on. If the impulse is not sufficient, they're off. Let's try and explain this a bit more graphically. Okay, so let's talk about how motor units relate to the production of maximal force in a muscle. So we're talking about fiber recruitment and you'll remember that we have three different fiber types in the skeletal muscular system. And on this graph here, we're going to try and explain how those three types in a particular order are recruited to produce force. And they're recruited in a particular order up to a maximum. So on our graph here on the left hand side on the y axis, we've got the percentage recruitment of motor units. So that's what we've just mentioned, uh, the group of fibers attached to a neuron, each one being a motor unit. So the percentage up to 100% of motor units within a muscle, if we need to produce maximum force, that is the, the, the most force production that that muscle can produce, we need to recruit all the motor units. We have to recruit all of them. But what's really interesting, and this, this concept is Henneman's size principle, what's really interesting is we actually recruit those motor units in a particular order. We will always begin by trying to meet the force demand by recruiting type 1 motor units, therefore type 1 muscle fibres. And if we can meet the demand, if we can lift the weight, just by using type 1 fibers then the body will prefer to do that the body will always begin with type 1 fibers and the reason for that predominantly is the type 1 fibers although they don't produce much force they also work aerobically they work with the aerobic system so there's minimal byproducts um, of, of aerobic respiration so therefore the body can handle this kind of this level of intensity this level of output demand really quite easily if it can be done with the type 1 fibers so sub-maximal force production, so less than maximum force production, will recruit type 1 fibres first. And if we can meet the force requirement with type 1 fibres, we'll do it with type 1 fibres. However, if we've then used all of our type 1 fibres, we've recruited them all. So all of those motor units made up of type 1 fibres, don't forget that each motor unit is only made up of one type of fiber. So let's recruit all of the type one fibers and still we haven't produced enough force in that muscle to move the weight or to, to continue running or jumping or whatever it is we want to do. We're gonna ne next need to recruit the next type of fiber. So we'll go, the body will then go to the next most efficient fiber, which is the 2A fibers, the next fiber um, is the 2A fibre because the 2A fibre is somewhat aerobic. It has some aerobic capacity and yet it can produce greater force than the type 1 fibres. So we're going to recruit our type 1 fibres first. If we max all those out, we've used all those and we still haven't produced the required force, we're next going to start to recruit our 2A motor units with our 2A fibres in them. And if we meet the force requirement, if that weight starts to move or what have you, if we're moving at the correct speed, running at the correct speed or, or what, whatever, then good times. We've, we've, met the, we've met the demand with type 1 and type 2A fibres. We can continue to add on top more 2A fibres um, by recruiting more 2A motor units up until obviously we've recruited them all. And if we've recruited all the type 1 fibres, we've recruited all the 2A fibres and we still haven't budged that weight, then we need to rely upon or top it up with the 2X fibres. So we're going to get the type 1s involved first. 
If they do the job, great. If not, we'll get the two A's involved. If together they can do the job, fantastic. If not, we'll get the two X's involved. Let's try and explain this um, pictorially just briefly. Here's a, a stylized cross section through a muscle with the three different fiber types. So the type one fibers are the very small red ones, uh, the red dots that represent uh, the fibers running towards you out the screen, if you like, as we cut through the muscle um, as a cross section. Um, and there's lots of them and they're quite small and you'll see that they're bundled up in the diagram. They're bundled up into motor units. So when that motor unit contracts, all of those fibers are going to contract with it. So the small ones, the type one fibers, they're red because there's good blood supply because they're aerobic fibers. They can use oxygen. So the blood supply has to be there. The other red ones, the ones that are slightly bigger, slightly chunky, and there's slightly fewer of them in each motor unit, those represent the type 2A fibers. So they're also red because they've also uh, got a good blood supply because they can also be used aerobically. And then you, you'll see on the diagram, I've just got one motor unit that's made up of type 2X fibers. That's the white ones. So they're white because, again, they have very little blood supply because they're not used for uh, aerobic exercise. They are for power and uh, sprint events, really short, sharp bursts um, of maximal intensity. And they're just needed, as the graph we've just looked at shows us, they're just needed if we want to get up towards our maximal force output for the muscle. So working through in order then, as we've just done on the graph, the first thing that happens if we want to um, produce some force in the muscle is we'll first of all recruit the, recruit the type 1 fibres. So there you, you can see them wobbling a little bit on the screen. That's just to represent the type 1 fibres of being innovated. They've been recruited and they're, they're contracting. Now, we, depending on the force that we need, we didn't necessarily need to recruit all the type 1s. We could have recruited two or three or four of those motor units. But don't forget the motor unit as a whole must be recruited together. And if there's sufficient electrical impulse coming to that motor unit, then the whole motor unit, all the fibers in that motor unit will contract. And remember, remember that's the all or non law. So here we've got sufficient impulses to all six of these motor units that are type one motor units and they're all contracting. It. And we still, for sake of argument, we've not lifted that weight that we're trying to lift. So next we're going to recruit our 2A motor units. So those are the other red ones. The type 2A fibers, they're oxidative fibers. Uh, they have the potential to use oxygen for uh, respiration, for producing energy. So we're going to get those going next. We're going to recruit those next. So I'm going to recruit all three of them. Off they go. So now we've got the type 1 fibers. We've got the type 2A fibers. All recruited, all being innovated at the same time. And we're, we're close now to maximal force production, but not quite. We're still technically sub-maximal. If we really wanted to take that muscle to its maximum force production, we would also need to recruit the 2X fibers. So on our graph here, I've got this idea that the maximal force production absolutely eyeballs out 100% um, force production. To get up there, we need to recruit all the fibers in all of the motor units. So it says here, maximal force production requires all the fibers in all the motor units to fire. So if this muscle that we've got on the screen here, if this muscle is going to be maximally um, producing force, we need our type 2X fibers involved as well. So there they go. So now we've got all of our motor units firing at the same time. And only when that's the case can we say that the muscle has reached maximal force production. Well, I hope that's been a helpful explanation for you on nervous control and muscle contraction. See you in the next video.